All right, folks, James Swift of Uncommon Journalism here, and as always, we have Kristen M. Gelati on the other end of the line here. We're actually going into the world of video now, doing our Fresh Faces, Frightening Fun Facts with Kit Kat Kristen and Jazzy James podcast here, the inaugural edition. So how's it feel? Yes, I was going to say, the uh, Fresh Faces are back to say, boo, and beware to all lion-hearted listeners uh, the, BE mo- the BER months have arrived, and schools are back in session. Students probably believe that this academic year will be uneventful due to virtual learning and limited capacities in the classrooms. Not quite. Goosebumpses, Salami oh. would say, don't think like a dummy. Dummy! Because after watching these movies... Students and staff may have a consequential and fateful school year. These films have diverse plots to enhance the terror and torture in the characters' lives. Whether the protagonists or antagonists are conscientious or conscientious or negligent with studying and sports, adjusting to a new school or town, danger still lurks. So ready or not, let's begin elaborating. And what a perfect segue there. Fantastic introduction as always here. And so our uh, installment here, titling this one, Academic Horrors. We're taking a look at uh, a bunch of, you know, movies that have a sort of classic theme to it, either focusing on school life, college life, basically any time you're being graded on the curve of terror. All right. So, of course, we do our uh, ten movies here. Somewhat random, a little bit arbitrary, but that's the best way to do it. So we're going from not the best to the best. I hate to use the term worst because, you know, they all have their merits here. So starting off is a movie I think is very sort of emblematic of a lot of the academic horror movies over the years. Uh, there have been so many high school theme slash movies. Return to Horror High, Slaughter High, Hell High, Horror High. I mean, it just goes on and on. And this yes, one, it does. And this one is a, is a fairly generic one from 1982 called Final Exam. And... Uh, not a whole lot to say about this one. It's a very sort of you know, straightforward movie. So did anything strike you in particular about this particular movie? Final exam. Well, I don't hate it. Um, it's a fun movie to come across. But it's one of those types of films to watch when you're bored, flipping channels, and just not motivated to study. Uh, it is a ludicrous, underrated, low-budget horror film where it is obvious who the top victims will be, such as the obnoxious fraternity brothers, the vulnerable Pledge and his love-stuck girlfriend, uh, also the wealthy and spoiled roommate. More importantly, there is no complete plot or legend to the unknown assailant. Like, there are so many unanswered questions like, who is he? Why is he torturing the students at Lanier College? Is he an alumni? Did he have bad experiences when he was in school that caused him to stalk and slaughter? And also, is he a male for sure? Because there have been female killers in disguise in the past. Yeah, they really don't even try to give a sort of explanation as to why this character is running around killing everybody. So it kind of reminded me of Black Christmas in sort of a way. You don't really have sort of a, a mea culpa or an explanation. The thing about this movie is I think the character film is a little bit better than most slash movies from the early, early 80s. You have a little bit more nuance to characters. And uh, I don't know, I think the thing that really struck me most about this movie is by genre convention, you have to have the prank gone awry. Like uh, the one in House of Drip Blood and uh, House of Sorority Row always starts off with some prank that goes awry and, of course, it sparks a killing. Okay, so in this one, totally going against top for the genre. It's uh, basically something where, and it kind of shows sort of the difference in sort of uh, how we see society in 1980 compared to today. Uh, is they play a prank, and their prank is they stage a fake terrorist attack on their college. Yes. Yep. It's something you probably couldn't get away with today. I mean, they didn't get, you know, suspended for it. Today, you go to Guantanamo Bay. Oh, absolutely not. And also, aside from that um, terrorizing prank, I acknowledge Studious Courtney, uh, the lone survivor, who kind of spend 
off like Lori Strode in Halloween uh, for wanting to get a good grade in organic chemistry and abnormal psychology. Because when I was in college, and if there were courses not relevant to journalism, business administration, marketing, I could care less. So congratulations to her. Hey, she got the grades and she survived the movie, so... She sure did. So, yeah, pretty much the only thing of note about the movie, I think, is the guy who directed is a guy named Jack uh, Houston, I believe. And the only other movie he's really famous for is My Best Friend is a Vampire. That great, great 1987 cult comedy movie, I want to say? Roughly, yes. All right, so, yeah, final exam. Like I said, it's not a terrible movie. It's just as far as, you know, the genre canon, there's way better high school and college-themed slasher movies out there to go through, so... It's there if you want it, but you can skip it. Again, it's something to watch at your leisure. All right, and moving along in our countdown to number nine, we have from 1983, John Carpenter slash Stephen King's Christine. And I know you are the resident Stephen king holic so you get to introduce this one. Yes, uh, Christine, uh, which is another Stephen King masterpiece, directed by the one and only John Carpenter. And this movie was still at the bottom of the list because it wasn't as terrifying as I had anticipated. Like, I expected the 1958 Plymouth Fury to talk when she attacked or more of a story as to how she became possessed and why. Um, Instead, she played zestful 1950s classics such as I Wonder Why by Dion and the Belmonts, Keep a Knockin', from Little Richard, and in the scene when Lee and Dennis are crushing Christine, they play the famous Rock and Roll is Here to Stay by Danny and the Juniors. And then at the end, Lee says, God, I hate rock and roll. Well, you know what? I love rock and roll, so put another dime in that car, baby. So there's so many you know, idiosyncratic John Carpenter things about this movie. Now, I almost actually kind of forgot he directed it when I went back to go rewatch it recently, so it kind of took me with a loop. So this movie actually came out the same year the uh, novel came out. So are there any major discrepancies in the plots of the two or any sort of overlap? Well, I wouldn't say um, about the overlapping plots, but here is one fun fact. Uh, In the scene where uh, Dennis and the jocks are in the library and are trying to pursue Lee Cabot, uh, Dennis goes to the shelf and picks up, what do you know, Christine by Stephen King. And R.I.P. to poor Kelly Preston. And as far as the actors, uh, Keith Gordon, who was um, Arnie Cunningham, he also appeared in Back to School, Dressed to Kill, and also directed and screenplayed The Chocolate War. So again, it's just, I, I wouldn't say that there are any discrepancies. Again, it's just, it's a mild horror movie. It's, it's a little different to have a possessed haunted car. So, is there any like, actual canonical explanation of why the car is haunted? Do we know? I, I watched the movie, I read a little bit of the synopsis, the, the novel itself, and yes. I never really got a clear takeaway as to what's going on there. So, is it just like some girl who died in the 50s who took over a Dodge Plymouth? Or, I mean, there's just the, the usual Stephen King deus ex machina, literally in this case. Right, I mean... We don't really know, like, the history of Christine, but, I mean, I know what she does when she gets jealous. I mean, uh, she practically choked Lee to death on that hamburger. Um, she really slaughtered the bullies, such as Buddy Reperton, Moochie Welch. Yes, that was his name. I mean, she, they got their karma back, that's for sure. So, um, I know her slaughtering performances, but I really don't know how it all started and why is she just this terror track of evil. Yeah, I think if they remade the movie today, it'd be like a Tesla. Or just something, you know, with, you know, a USB drive that's demonically possessed or something. I agree. Or it may, if they can remake Christine as like an Uber ride or something. I mean, unlimited possibilities yes. there. And per, and James, it's funny you mentioned that because per our last podcast, one of the questions was, um, which movies would you like to see a remake of? And Christine was one of them because, because again, that movie came out in 1983 and up until now where, um, you know, there's more technology, um, you know, more expansion with special effects. 
also will they enhance the plot just to have Christine make more sense? See, I think probably, you know, the grand pantheon of John Carr movies. Not my favorite movie in his oeuvre, but still, you know, it's, it's pretty good. You know, not my favorite Stephen King adaptation, but it's a very solid movie. You know, it's a lot more dimensional than the plot sounds like, where it's just, no, possessed car killing everybody. I mean, there's certainly more meat to it than that. So if you've never seen it before, check it out. I think it's, it might surprise you. I will. Um, it sounds uh, <clears throat> amusing. All right, and moving along to number eight, a movie with absolutely no subtext whatsoever. A Nightmare on Elm Street Part Two, Freddy's Revenge. <laughs> Nightmare on Elm Street Two, Freddy's Revenge. Yes, um, a lot has gone on with uh, 1428 Elm Street, which is the former home of Nancy Thompson. I would like to add that uh, Nightmare on Elm Street 2 is about to uh, celebrate its uh, 35th reunion. Yes, it was uh, released on November the 1st of 1985. Oh my God. Whoa, what's happening to me? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <gasps> oh. What was that? Okay. So let me on. Let me carry on with the story before I got rudely interrupted. Um, sometimes I wish people were not so narrow-minded about the movie, calling it the gay nightmare on Elm Street film. I liked this movie because Freddy Krueger has the ability to control someone else with a killing spree, rather than just doing it on his own. Um, in the first Nightmare on Elm Street. Um, we were introduced um, to the character of Freddy Krueger and what he does, but this was rather intriguing to see him feed on the fear by Jesse Walsh and come out of his body. The famous Freddy Krueger quote was, you've got the body, I've got the brain. So it's, again, I really like this movie and great performance by Mark Patton who was Jesse Walsh, and I'd like to add that I met him at my first Days of the Dead in 2012. Um, we got a picture with the hands. Um, he was willing to uh, talk about a film that he starred in that affected and impacted his life uh, from many years ago. Again, very nice guy, very approachable, and um, I hope to meet him again. And there was also Robert England who played Freddy Krueger, who I met at Dragon Con last year. And check this out. Look, look. Oh, oh we're look, all Look, I got, yes, yes. Yes. I um, did not see the real talkative side of him, but again, um, he was very professional, very open-minded, that you would never think that he would star as this um, slicey dicey killer. Um, there was Robert Roosler, who played Grady, a fun fact was Robert Downey Jr. drove him to the audition of Nightmare on Elm Street 2. So this must have been during or after Weird Science. And of course, uh, Christy Clark, um, who played Jesse's little sister, known for her role as Carrie Brady in Days of Our Lives. From what I read, she also battled the coronavirus. So I do hope and pray that she is in great strength and high spirits once again. So I have to ask, you know, with the glove, do you want to go hunt down your old high school gym coach? Heck, yeah. I mean, well, yeah, actually I do. Um, you know, I was in cross country and track when I was in high school. Um, I may not have been the star, but still, um, that would be good just to uh, to see him, to see the vicious side of me, you know what I mean? So I'm all up for it. <laughs> You know, there are just so many aspects and layers to this movie. You know, obviously with the, the gay subjects going on, back in the day, no one really picked up on that. Now it's pretty much the only thing anyone ever talks about when they talk about the movie. Uh, but like you said, I, I do come out the idea of it being I was a teenage Freddy Krueger, kind of being the sort of motif here. But the thing about this movie is, and this is a complaint you see a lot of fans here, and nice manicure, by the way, is uh, that the rule set is a little kind of confusing. You know, where Freddy Krueger is jumping in and out of reality, where you don't know if he's actually killing people in dreams or in the real world. You don't know if, you know, Mark's doing it or Freddy's doing it. So how do you sort of, you know, make out the, the plot there? How do you get the unball there? 
Right. And additionally, um, Robert England's only major scene was the pool party at Lisa's house where Freddy Krueger jumps out and he says, you are all my children. So, again, to piggyback what you're saying, the only Krueger scenes were the stunt effects um, coming out of Jesse's body, um, contorting movements um, for when he was about to do last-minute attacks. Also, the bus scene at the beginning, because at first, uh, Jesse has no idea who he was. So, if anything... um, if anything, this might have been easier for Robert England because he did have a smaller part in Nightmare on Elm Street too. And yeah, I'm glad you touched upon it because that school bus scene is one of the best openings of any slash movie of the 1980s. It just did such a great job of setting the tempo, and it's probably one of my top, you know, three or four favorite nightmares in the entire franchise. So, good job there. And the director, of course, is Jack Shoulder, who is known for doing pretty much this and nothing else. Unless I'm mistaken. Yes. I mean, what was the movie he did before this one? Because I know this was his second movie. He did that one slash movie with um, Donald Pleasance, but I forget the name of it. It was not a Halloween series, was it? No, it wasn't a Halloween. That's why I was really interested to see Donald Pleasance in it. But, uh, okay, I'm sure some astute viewer will send us, you know, 45 angry emails saying, obviously it was Don't Look Now or Alone in the Woods or something like that. But huh. it's an interesting movie. But yeah, it's It is. But yeah, I guess probably in, in, in the grand scheme of things, not my favorite Elm Street movie, but it's certainly entertaining. You know, it gives you everything you right. want from a Freddy Krueger movie. Maybe not so much the humor part, but come on, you got parakeets that are possessed and gym teachers being whipped to death with jump ropes. How can yes. you do Additionally, I'd like to add, um, a couple weeks ago, um, I saw a very intriguing documentary that came out last year called Scream Queen. My Nightmare on Elm Street, where um, Mark Patton states how the film, again, um, affected his life, brought out to, um, you know, like his homosexuality, AIDS, because AIDS was very popular in the 1980s. Um, But on a positive note, he was able to reunite with the cast. Um, He also shared uh, memorable conversations and photos with fans at the cons. And throughout the documentary, he attempted to make peace with his past, but there were forgiving and bittersweet moments, again, with, uh, with the way he was and the health problems that he's currently facing. And believe it or not, Nightmare on Elm Street 2 nearly jeopardized his acting career, but he seems to be handling it well. And, you know, you just got to keep on moving on, right? Right. I don't want to say too much because if Mark Patton were to listen to this, I mean, hey, I give him full credit. He did a wonderful job. I enjoyed meeting him. But again, the Scream Queen, My My Nightmare on Elm Street documentary, again, I think um, it really had a different perspective on me and I'm sure other audience members. Right. And I'm sure Shudder will enjoy getting the free endorsement there. The show is going to give us some free ad revenue. And from, oh, uh, no. yeah, and moving along from 1985 to 1996, we have number seven in our countdown, The Craft. The movie that I think probably more so even than Scream kind of kickstarted the 90s horror renaissance, but uh, I know you're not as big of a fan of this one for, for some peculiar reason. So what's uh, the... The Craft. <laughs> oh, The Craft. The Craft. You have to talk about The Craft. Mm-hmm. Because... I do not feel light as a feather, but rather stiff as a board, analyzing the craft. This is another low rating because snakes are repulsive. When I first watched this movie, um, I, I mean, at a friend's house, I mean, I immediately jumped up from the couch, went into the kitchen, and I had no appetite. So yes, that is my peculiar reason why I cannot bear the craft. But don't get me wrong. I mean, it's got superb acting, remarkable effects, unforgettable karma in the end, and also uh, Feruza Balk, Nev Campbell, Skeet Ulrich, Christine Taylor. Their stardom peaked in the 1990s, so that was very beneficial for them. And again, it's a very stimulating script because 
it's not a common situation where a troubled new girl um, transfers to a new school and befriends powerful witches and then later on finds out that she's a mystical misfit. And the featured song is I Have the Touch, which was first uh, sung and played by Peter Gabriel. So I did like part of the soundtrack as well. So in one way, it's kind of like a, you know, high fidelity, except with Wicca. Wicca? Mm-hmm. Is that what you said, Wicca? Mm-hmm. Wicca. I remember that was like a really popular this movie came out. All the, the goth girls in the school were totally into, you know, pagan rituals and stuff after that. So the movie definitely had a, had a major impact on the cultural level. Uh, one of the things I really liked about this movie, outside of the fantastic finale, which I know uh, destroyed your appetite there, is just, you know, how it sort of, you know, kind of uh, broke down the high school cliques. Because high school cliques, in a way, are almost always like covens in and of themselves. So this movie kind of took the whole, you know, 80s pastiche, you know, movies like The Breakfast Club and Heathers, and kind of put a new spin on it and gave us sort of that supernatural twist. So, I don't know, did, did you ever have any students or friends that kind of reminded you of people in the craft growing up? Oh, yes. I mean, who knows? I mean, I don't know if they actually did witchcraft, but yes, I mean, there are, I mean, there are some friends, I mean, there were some peers that, um, I mean, were very gothic, uh, worship that kind of stuff. Also, I mean, this uh, movie was in the middle of your list. So does that mean you have snakes piled up on your toilet? Well, I mean, not today. Not today? I mean, what about the other days? I mean, gerbils in the microwave, maybe, but, you know, not snakes in, in the toilet. Okay, but not snakes piled up in the toilet or uh, rats. Um, where, where were the rats? Like alongside the walls or, again, once was enough for me. Actually, the thing that freaked me out most were the cockroaches. Like, the snakes I'm okay with, the mice I can do, but the cockroaches, no, that's just a little bit too icky. Yes, and a lot of people were freaked out by the cockroaches, even some of my gothic friends. I guess it was just the way that they moved along the film, but also, they used real snakes in this film, didn't they? Oh, uh, to get a starring credit, don't they, at the end? I, 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 would, I would imagine so, because... Um, to my mo- to my knowledge, I mean, there was a documentary on how they used like the cylinder tube machine to thin out the snakes. Um, it was for the scene where Nancy's hands and hair began to do the snake fest. Ugh. But um, but again, I, I didn't see. I don't know if it was the director or the producer, but he held up like a mixture and a combination of snakes, and I was like, okay, that's the craft. Can't do this. <laughs> and it's really interesting. One final thing about this movie before moving along. The director is a guy named Andrew Fleming. who later, Andrew Fleming, yes. Who later directed the Nancy Drew movie, and he co-wrote it with... Co-wrote it. Is that the one with where Tiffany Paulson? It is indeed. Bingo. So, yes, Tiffany Paulson. Right, so she... The, she co-wrote it with uh, the Nancy Drew. I believe that came out in 2007. Uh, I want to say so. It could be off a year or two, but for those of us who don't remember who Tiffany Paulson is, can you give us a refresher? Yes. I, uh, yep, I remember that interview with her um, very well, and we talked a lot about um, Nancy Drew. And I remember, again, this does go back to two and a half years ago, but she did say that she um, did some work with Andrew Fleming, and that was the one. All right, so the craft... Maybe not the all-time classic other people make it out to be, but all right in my books. And once you got the snake, maybe they do like the, the anti-snake edit. You know, like the Snyder Cut for Justice League, and you can actually enjoy it. Hmm. You know what? I was going to say, I think this guy, I think he'll enjoy it too. Mm-hmm. All right, and we're actually kind of moving chronologically to the decades now. We went from uh, 85 to 96, so now we're going to the year 2010 for number six on the countdown. Directed by Matt Reeves, it is Let Me In. So, of course, this is the Americanization of Let the Right One In, and I have so much to say about this one, but I'll let you have the ground floor here and just uh, kind of introduce it. Wonderful. Uh, Let Me In, set in March of 1983 in uh, Los Alamos, New Mexico. Um, again, I this movie is still, I would say, at the bottom to the middle of the list because... Me personally, I like the roller coaster vampire movies such as Fright Night and The Lost Boys. 
This movie was more melancholy and often treacherous. I mean, especially the pool scene, um, where they were literally going to kill Owen. I mean, if they weren't going to drown him, they pulled a knife on him. So either way, like, they were literally trying to end his life. Um, But on a side note, we've been doing these podcasts in the evenings. Are you a vampire? Uh, would you hold it against me if I was? No. No, I was just curious, but I do know that this is our third podcast, and they have been in the evenings, and I'm like, you know what? It's possible that he could be a vampire. You know, I've never understood that. You know, why does everyone want to be a vampire but never like a mummy or like a creature from the Black Lagoon? I mean, that's the one I want. Or a werewolf, yes. Vampires really stick out. And um, in the movie, Let Me In, uh, they had some, a lot of nostalgia, early 1980s music such as The Breakup Song, Burning For You by uh, Blue Oyster Cult, also Boy George in the Arcade, and uh, great reminiscing with uh, Pac-Man and um, all those games that were around back then. What was the candy that she tried to eat? Um, now and later. It was. Okay, because I was like, all right. Early 1980s candies, I'm like, runts, nerds, airheads, I'm like, we got to know this. Okay, well, vintage. Abby kind of knew what it was like to be human again. Yeah, and uh, here's the thing, you know, this is obviously the remake of With the Right One In from 2008, and if that was on the countdown, that would be my number one for sure, because I absolutely adore that movie. And this is Let the Right One In. Mm-hmm. So this one, I kind of, I went into it kind of, you know, with uh, half-hearted expectations. Americanizations are kind of hit or miss when you have movies like this one. But I was actually pleasantly surprised with what Matt Reeves was able to do. I thought it was a very, very good movie. Great acting from uh, Chloe Grace Moritz. Uh, yes. Really great cast all the way around, really. And oh, they were. And um, I'm sorry to cut you off, but Chloe Grace Moritz, um, on the subject of horror, she went on to pay, to portray Carrie White in the remake of Carrie, so that was a good stretch there. Mm-hmm. Oh, and that one will definitely not be showing up later on the countdown or anything. Obviously, can't yes, it is. Or... Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of really, really great things about this movie. I like the fact that it's more or less a scene-by-scene remake of the original, but it throws in a couple different curves, and I think probably the highlight movie for me would be the scene with the car chase. I have never seen a car wreck film like that where you have the interior and you got the Blue Oyster Cult going on. It was such a cool sort of dynamic that uh, you really don't see in a lot of horror movies. Yes, and that was an everlasting scene. In fact, um, the other day when I was preparing for this podcast, I was like, my gosh, like there is this, this is dynamite right here. I mean, they're playing Burning for You. Um, he's getting slaughtered. He's got this uh, stalker in the back. I was like, this is an awesome scene. Also, if Owen didn't invite Abby in, like, what would have happened? Like, would she have kept bleeding? Would she have died? I mean, what happens when you don't invite a vampire in? Well, that reminds me of that that great 1995 movie, Canceling an Interview with a Vampire. That's that's another good flick. Mm-hmm. Um, so... Think of, there's another thing about this movie that really kind of struck me, and oh, you're gonna love this one because when I rewatched the movie, I kept thinking to myself, this movie really reminds me of something non horror y from the 1980s, and I couldn't really quite put my finger on it until I realized this is actually like a hard horror version of Weird Science because it's about the outcast, yes, it is, and the female suddenly enters his life and shows him how to be a stand up guy. So, did you kind of see that kind of comparison going on? Right, uh, for sure. In fact, uh, uh, Owen, um, again, uh, very introverted, uh, neglected by his mom, tormented by his classmates, and uh, then he meets the girl of his dreams, and then his life changes around. A lot of weird science elements with that. Okay, and have, you, have you read the book the, the movie is based on? I have not, but that is on my list. Okay, so I'm going to do a, a quick spoiler here to kind of throw the movie into a, a different perspective here. The movie alone is very disturbing and depressing, but the book is like a hundred times worse and darker. So one of the things that's not really addressed in either of the movies is the fact that Eli is actually a boy. So it's actually like a trans vampire, I guess, would be the a trans buyer. 
a trans or a transgender vampire. Well, more or less. It gets a lot darker in the, the novelization, but that's kind of the gist of it. Which movies don't kind of explore that element. That it's actually technically like a prepubescent boy-on-boy love affair. Interesting. I'm going to have to read this book. You really uh, piqued my interest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just uh, be sure to do it you know, during the daytime hours and avoid baths. Which is ironic because director Matt Reeves is now directing the Batman movie. So, full circle. Yes. All right, and I'm going to let you out of the ground floor on this one because I don't really have any strong opinions either way on this one. From 1998, coming at the middle of the pack here, it is Robert Rodriguez's The Faculty. The Faculty, yes. So, this movie was released on Christmas Day in 1998. And this movie was at the top of my list because it's a mixture of action, horror, and suspense. And there is so much hit to this movie. Um, And it also has um, Elijah Wood, who was one of my college crushes, and also becomes the hero at the end. Um, Again, um, I love this movie. Seductive scenes, energetic effects. In the beginning, uh, there is a Fright Night reintroduction where Coach Willis, portrayed by Robert Patrick, stabs a pencil through Principal Drake's hand. And then Piper Laurie, also uh, the drama teacher, where she becomes a vicious alien. And the hip part about it is there's this powdery cocaine-like drug that can only kill the alien. So if Zeke was not in the movie, they would not have survived. Also, this alien needs water to survive. Excuse me. Uh, You know, I need water to survive this vodcast. Oh, my. I was thirsty. Uh, So going back, um, one of my favorite characters was the Southerner, uh, Mary Beth Louise Hutchinson, who, um, or the actress is Laura Harris, whom I really liked um, back in the early 1990s when she starred in Nickelodeon's 15, um, where she went from the intellectual straight-A student in 15 to a malevolent, deceiving, and harmful alien queen. And uh, again, there is just great cast, um, like I was saying before, great effects, uh, and it it was a good way to end the 1990s generation. Yeah, 15, that's a show I haven't thought of in literally like 25 years, so you've rattled yes, it's... Really. <laughs> so yeah, like I said, this is a great cast. I mean, you've got so many versatile people. you got John Stewart playing the biology teacher. You've got uh, Usher Raymond playing, you know, one of the studs in the movie. Um, T-1000 himself, Robert Patrick, playing one of the lead yep. villains here. Uh, Jordana Brewster, who was Delilah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, going back to Elijah Wood. Uh, is it Clea Duvall? Am I saying her name right? Clea Duvall, who was uh, Stokely. Okay, and this one was written by uh, Kevin S. Williamson, correct? The same guy who did Scream and I know what you did last summer? Yes. So, yeah, he was like the guy. He was like the Jordan Hill of the early 1990s where he was just doing everything. So his name is all over this stuff. And, you know, this is one of those movies where I think where he's kind of at the crest of the post-Scream uh, teen horror renaissance we had there. So this one, you know, kind of took the whole sci-fi angle, a little reminiscent of the thing, especially the part with the drug scene where, you know, the one girl freaks out because she's possessed. Um, not really my favorite movie, but I can understand why you enjoy it because it is a very, very fun popcorn movie. You know, you just kick back, enjoy it, and uh, you don't have to think too much, so I'm a fan of that one. Right. And it's also one of those situations where, I mean, you are intimidated by your teachers, like either for um, giving out too much homework or failing the test. But no, I mean, you are petrified of them because they are aliens. And your concern is, will I become infected? And who's going to become infected next? Kind of like coronavirus, where it's just, it spreads. The infestation just spreads. So uh, that's another reason why um, I... uh, drew close to the uh, faculty because um, mm-hmm. they were they were quite the victims, those uh, aliens. Yes. 
All right, and moving along from a horror movie with a lot of comedic elements is a comedy with a lot of horror elements, and I'm a huge fan of this one, a huge fan of the entire franchise. 2015, the live-action Goosebumps adaptation. So I know you've got some great props for this one. I've, I've been excited all week. Well, okay, first, uh, Goosebumps. Yes, this is a dynamic movie based on the book series such as Night of the Living Dummy, and let's reintroduce Slappy here. Say hi. Uh, so Night of the Living Dummy, The Haunted Mask, The Abominable Snowman of Pasadena, and The Werewolf of Fever Swamp, and so many others. And Jack Black and R.L. Stein appear in the movie, but they switch roles. Hello, Mr. Stein. Hello, Mr. Black. Perfect. You know, and there's a throwaway line in the movie where Jack Black is playing R.L. Stein. They're actually cracked about saying, you know, oh, I'm a Stephen King ripoff. I've actually sold more books than Stephen King. I'm like, oh, that's a great joke. I went on Wikipedia and found out that's true. R.L. Stein actually has sold more books than Stephen King. Yes, he did. Mm -hmm. And when they uh, discuss those uh, elements in the movie, um, again, I, he, like, he felt so competitive against Stephen King. But also at the same time is R.L. Stein wrote more books and published them than Stephen King. So again, that was that was pretty interesting to see. So yeah, there are so many things going on in this movie. It's kind of a all-star goosebumps jamboree. When the announced idea for the movie, I didn't think it would ever pan out. I had no idea how to get like, you know, thirty or forty different stories in there in one movie. But I actually did a pretty sort of, you know, innovative take on it where you actually have, you know, R.L. Stein's entire, you know, literary universe being trapped in some extra dimension and the kids unwittingly living them out and having basically like the entire you know universe of R.L. Stein monsters attack this one town. Um, I mean they had everything. They had uh, the evil camera from Say Cheese and Die. They had um, the evil journal. My best friend is invisible. That one. That the big loose end at the very end. So I mean they pretty much covered everything. The evil lawn gnomes. All the characters were here and uh it had a lot of rooms to the old TV show, which I thought was also pretty uh, fun to watch back being a kid of the 90s. Yes. And one scene that really brings out um, the fandom of this movie is Zack and Stein's heart-to-heart -heart conversation. Because it turns out that Hannah Fairchild is the imaginary figure of Stein's The Ghost Next Door. But to him, I mean, she's real. Like, he treats her like a daughter... He controls her. He doesn't have anyone else. And, like, he's, he's, he's lonely. And Zach reaches out to him and said, Hey, I'm having trouble coping with the recent loss of my dad. I just moved to a new school. I don't know anyone. So once they share that, um, their friendship really grows. And it actually uh, brings me back to a similar situation that I was in a few years ago at work where I was at a client site as an operation support customer service analyst. And my boss at the time, um, very nonchalant and jaunty. Um, I mean, not, I mean, not as meticulous as most bosses, thank God. It turns out that he was struggling um, with the deep challenge as well. His partner was dying of cancer. And we, uh, we were surrounded by spoiled colleagues. I mean, they got free candy, free food, their paychecks, obviously. And also, they seem to be um, very happy with their marriages and satisfied with their lifestyles, et cetera, et cetera. And when he confided that to me, he quickly turned away and said, you wouldn't understand. And then I said, no, I do, because I had gone through a very rough breakup uh, the year before, and I was envious of my coworkers. So, again, once we share that, uh, the working relationship just grew. And then going back to the Goosebumps movie, like they said, um, all these uh, precious memories, it's in here, and it's in there. That was a lot more sentimental than I expected. And take on Goosebumps <laughs> to be that was that was fantastic. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it was definitely not horror for once. I was just going to say it reminded me of the Goonies and be done with it, but you got my story beat there. Because it certainly did have sort of that, that 80s vibe to me. It felt like, you know, the great movies, you know, like E.T. and The Searchers were kind of had that juvenile fantasy element to it. And uh, 
it made me feel like a kid again. And I thought it was yes, a, a, and it was it had it had a lot of animation. Yeah. Also, uh, speaking of being a kid, there were also some Pinocchio elements in Goosebumps, where Stein uh, burns the book to turn Hannah into a real girl. Ah, yes. And I have to say, this one, the original is way better than the sequel. That's just my opinion, but I'm, I'm a controversial guy. Um, okay, I won't say anything because I actually like both. Um, okay, and since you've seen the second one, who knows, maybe Slappy will turn you into the main character. This is going to have such a low box office return. Anything starring me is going to be <laughs> yeah. it's just poison. So yeah, pretty much the only thing I have to say about Goosebumps from there is the guy who directed it, and his name escapes me, is also the guy who did the, uh, the Pokemon movie last year. Yes. I, I can't pronounce it. I could try to pronounce it, but it, it, it's probably going to come out incorrectly, and that's embarrassing. Yep, so you never, we might get a Fear Street franchise coming down the line a couple of years from now, so hopefully it's kind of bodes well. And I thought it was a great, great movie, unironic. It is. Oh, it is. I mean, it, it was definitely um, a roller coaster. Again, it's got horror, it's got comedy, it's got some romance, it's got some animation. I loved it. All right, and moving along from one beloved uh, children's horror franchise to the next, and this one is interesting because you're the only person I've ever met who actually has strong feelings one way or another about 2019's Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. So. To Tell in the Dark. Yes, indeed. Crazy costumes. Marvelous movie. Astonishing acting. And, voila. I'm, I'm at the Scholastic Book Fair all over again. Stories heal. Stories hurt. If we repeat them often enough, they become true. Tell me a story, tell me a story, tell me a story. Adapted from Alvin Schwartz's popular series, um, the film sets on Halloween, one of my favorite holidays, in 1968, a.k.a. the season of the witch. And with this movie, you are really jumping into a time machine by seeing the walkie-talkies, curlers and hair, TV with the antennas and revolving buttons, and also the TV dinners were somewhat novice then. It was also entertaining to see the old-fashioned trick-or-treating where you not only get candy, but back then you were able to throw rotten eggs and dirt at houses and such and cars because, believe me, Tommy Milner deserved it. And afterwards, what better yet to get stuck and spooked at a real haunted house on Halloween night. Let me elaborate a little bit more. Um, I am thankful to be a pescatarian because I would be appalled to nearly swallow a corpse's toe in beef stew. Oh, yuck. Yeah, oh my gosh, that makes me nauseated just to hear that. And far out to the monsters, no, excuse me, not monsters, but live actors who portrayed the monsters. Um, especially Troy James, uh, who was a jangly man. Um, he is even called Twisty Troy and has coped with his flexibility throughout his life. And the pale lady, I mean, how much more creative can you get? I mean, a monster sucking her victim into her stomach? I mean, it was almost too sweet and innocent when she first gave Chuck a hug. You know, looking back on the, the whole Scary Stories uh, franchise there, I mean, it's amazing just how dark and morbid and, and ghoulish some of these stories are. Like, I mean, the one I remember the most was the one about the uh, the butcher who literally murders children in a village and feeds them to the other townspeople. So, considering that's the source material, I'm not really sure how this is going to be adapted to a PG-13 horror movie, but I think for the most part it actually worked out pretty well. I mean, it, it kind of feels to me like... The way I describe this movie is it's kind of like somewhere between Goosebumps and It, you'll have this scary story to tell in the dark. So it's that good sort of intermediate range. Yes. And also, I can relate to the main character, Stella, who is an, aspi an aspiring writer, but is uncertain about her life. Um, she also lacks self-confidence in the beginning and will not allow anybody else to read her stories. 
But once she encountered the dramatic Cerebello's events, bam, she was able to proceed with her writing. And again, I can relate to that because although I'm passionate about writing, I mean, I still feel, I still encounter the low self-esteem, like, okay, will the audience be intrigued? Or what should I write about? Or, uh, you know, like, where is this going? But I don't know, I guess a funny or a scary incident has to happen in order to go further. Yeah, and have you heard anything on a potential sequel to the movie? I'm not quite sure I'd perform financially, but it seems like it'd be perfect for you know, a franchise. I really hope that they do come out with a sequel to the movie, um, because, because again, the ending, um, the, the ending is final, but it's not final, because Stella, her father, and Chuck's sister, Ruth, um, drive on to go look for Augie and Chuck, because although the monsters took them away, I, uh, I still don't believe that they're dead. I think that if they made a sequel to Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, Chuck and Augie will reappear, and um, Stella will probably uh, meet up with Ramon, and of course that they'll have uh, more creative monsters. All right, yeah. If I'm not mistaken, you actually have this at the very top of your list here, so I gave it a 10 out of 10 rating. So for those of you who... Uh, haven't seen the movie or skipped out because you think it's Kitty Fair, you know, what's your endorsement? You know, why do you think this movie is worth going out of your way to watch? Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark? Mm -hmm. It's a roller coaster ride. I mean, and again, I was always uh, fond of the Alvin Schwartz series. And also here is the movie kind of reiterates The Mummy from 1999, where it bestowed great wisdom, like you must not read the you must not read from the book. Yes, you must not read from the book. But the main characters did, and energetic ghouls were on the loose. Common sense, but it's still a good movie. But you just read from the book. Yes, I did. Oh, 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 the monsters are out to get me. Oh my gosh, I'm so scared. Look, you got the big toe, and then you got the wendigo. Maybe I might have a spider come out of my cheek. But no, no snakes out of the toilet, hopefully. No snakes. Please, no snakes. All right, we're getting close here. We're at number two on the countdown here from 1996, probably the epitome of 1990s horror, Scream. So, so much has been said about this movie, and I can only imagine what sort of prop you brought along for this one. Scream, yes. And also, this is directed... Try not to make a lot of noise here. This was directed by none other than Wes Craven. And this movie came out in 1996. So we are approaching the 25 years. This movie is basically a reinvention of the slasher horror genre, but a more modern horror cult classic. Like, Wes Craven really brings out the tension, the cleverness, the gruesome acts. The hilarious moments. What is your favorite scary movie? Horror movies referenced are Nightmare on Elm Street, Halloween. Jamie Lee Curtis was literally called a scream queen in this movie. The Exorcist, uh, where Linda Blair was the uh, one of the obnoxious reporters in the beginning. Carrie, Terror Town. And as far as the characters, Skeet Ulrich, guess what his character was named? Billy Loomis. Of course, from the birds, right? Yes. And outstanding and notable cast. Um, you got Nev Campbell, Drew Barrymore. Um, and as my, it is my understanding that she was supposed to play the demanding role of Sidney Prescott, but had other obligations in her personal life, so she only did the... Um, you know, like the first victim, Casey Becker. Uh, there was Courtney Cox, Matthew Lillard, Henry Winkler, the former Fonz, and also Wes Craven, who played uh, the janitor in that one short scene where he wore the Freddy Krueger shirt. And also, there uh, there's a pandemic in this movie as well, kind of like what we are going through, where in Scream, there's a killer on the loose, so they shut down the schools um, in our world. There's a plague on the loose, so they shut down, well, everything. Convention centers, restaurants, bars, gyms, sadly. 
You know, this movie came out, I mean, the horror genre was about as dead as a, as a doornail at that point in time. So this completely resurrected the entire, you know, horror industry. One of the things that's really striking about this movie is it came out in 1996 and it was making fun of, you know, Halloween and Friday the 13th and all these movies from the 80s. And but, Nightmare on Elm Street. But here we are, you know, 25 years later, where now this is the old nostalgic horror movie. So it kind of holds up a little bit differently because it being a parody and sort of metaphysical and kind of you know, cutting into the nuances of the horror genre and deconstructing it a little bit. But yeah, I rewatched this movie recently and I was shocked at just how well it holds up. I mean, the story is great. The acting, fantastic. The pacing is just tremendous. The kill scenes are just over the top and just tremendous. And of course, you know, Jamie Kennedy's character is like pretty much everybody watching this video right now. He is the horror geek. And he kind of becomes like the every person, kind of the, the spokesperson you insert yourself in the movie as. Um... So do you have like a particular favorite scene or line or moment from the movie? Well, um, honestly, the very beginning of Scream, I mean, it, it's a good movie overall, but the very beginning of Scream where um, Drew Barrymore is slaughtered, again, I will always remember the notable death of Casey Becker uh, because as the movie goes on, like her insides were out. And if you look at that scene, her insides literally were out. I mean, she was just hanging from the tree, bloody, like just all chopped up. And um, I mean, the effects are great. And also, um, when she first encounters the killer, um, I mean, he she's on the phone with him. He won't let her go. And then they start. That, that's when the movie really starts analyzing and um, spinning off uh, the uh, horror movies. And again, there's a lot of Friday the 13th in there, Halloween. Um, she guesses it wrong about, um, you know, Jason Voorhees' mom uh, being the original killer. Um, so then Steve gets slaughtered. But again, that is that scene, that scene is a legend, even almost 25 years later. I think for me, my favorite scene is a complete throwaway. It's a line nowhere talks about. It's the part where uh, Randy's actually in the video store talking about how all the murders are eerily reminiscent of the entire Jamie Lee Curtis filmography. Where he's like, if you yes. only watch, if you'd only watch Prom Night, you know what's going on, which is something I can totally see myself doing in real life. Right, and and you know what? Back then, Blockbuster existed. I mean, like nowadays, there are no video stores. There's no Blockbuster, no VHSs, no. Um, what is it? Uh, CDs. I mean, there there are. I mean, you, you have to download it now. But yeah, no video stores, and I miss them. I really do. Yeah, and I always uh, I always feel remiss about bringing this up. One of the things that Scream never gets any credit for is having a really great soundtrack. No one ever brings it up. I'm talking about you know its lasting legacy. So you got you know the Nick Cave on there. You've got uh, that one Blue Oyster Cult cover. You've got the uh, Youth of America by Bird Brain, a great you know early '90s post grunge band. So it's really sort of emblematic of the times. It kind of encapsulates everything that made, you know, 1996 such a great time to have a Blockbuster membership. I like how you brought that up because I love the soundtrack. In fact, uh, Youth of America by Birdbrain, that was on the list. Whisper to a Scream by Soho. And who could ever forget? School's out for the summer, school's out forever. That was originally from Alice Cooper, right? It was. Perfect. But either way, I like the more like '90s grunge alternative version in this in this scene. And of course, there's been uh, let's see, there's been three official sequels so far. You had the MTV show, which I never watched. I think there's another sequel coming out. I mean, they're all various shades of decent, but for me, the original is definitely still the king. That's the one that made the most impact on me, and I think holds up the best out of the entire franchise. I agree, and I'll confess, um, I have not gone past Scream Two. Um, I don't want to do any spoilers here, but once, uh, once I watched Scream 2, I'm thinking, okay, this makes sense. This is why they had the sequel. The others, I'm like, okay, who is the killer now? Even though I already know. All right. And with that, we come to the number one movie on the countdown. I think this one, even if maybe it's not the best overall on the countdown, I mean, when you say academic horror, you say high school you say a horror movie. The very first thing that pops into your mind should be this movie. From 1976, it is Brian De Palma's Carrie. So I know, once again, you're the Stephen King uh, fangirl here. So and that was his first major work, if I'm correct, isn't it? Um, 
Um, as far as I know, yes. Um, again, this is another Stephen King film. And another unorthodox and bizarre movie directed, like you said, by Brian De Palma. And again, I like this movie. Um, I mean, it may not have been on the top final, final list, but what I do like about it is there are lots of close connections where uh, the director, Brian De Palma, was married to Nancy Allen, and he also um, did Dress to Kill, which he also starred in, along with Michael Caine and Keith Gordon. John Travolta was being introduced to his acting career, Again, that was his uh, early years in Carrie. The totally talented PJ Souls did Halloween and Rock and Roll High School. <laughs> yes, Rock and Roll High School shortly after Carrie. And William Catt, who was Tommy Ross, not only is he very good friends with Robert England, but his stardom peaked um, mainly in The Greatest American Hero, which I believe came out in 1981. You know, uh, this is one of the movies where I think, out of all the movies on this, this is the one that I think is truly the most timeless. I mean, this movie is going to resonate from now until teenagers stop existing. I think at some point in our lives, we all kind of feel like Carrie. We all feel like we're the outsider, that we don't fit in. You know, at some point, we're going to get bullied or have people say mean stuff to us. And I think this movie kind of touches into that really, really dark side we all have. You know, that if we could ever, you know, get our comeuppance or, you know, get revenge on our wrongdoers. Yeah, we might actually end up setting the entire high school gymnasium on fire. Who knows? I mean, she got revenge with her telekinetic powers. Oh, let me try that again. Telekinetic powers. I was just like, telekin... It sounds like the library scene where she was like, telekinesis. She's like, oh, is this what it means? But nobody knew that Carrie was a monster. The taglines are, you were warned never to push Carrie to the limits. Now you must face the evil consequences. Or, short and sweet, take Carrie to the prom. I dare you. You know, the thing about this, it, it's such a great movie because it's not really an outright horror movie until like the last 20 minutes when you have, of course, and it's not really a spoiler for movies come out like 45 years ago. We all know what happens. But it's just such, you don't want anything bad to happen to Sissy Spacek's character. You want her to kind of, you know, come into her own and get accepted and live a normal life. But as is the case in real life so many times, the best laid plans don't happen. And it's such a tragic, tragic movie. And it holds up so much better than I think a lot of horror movies from the 1970s. It just has that human pathos to it, which is kind of lacking in a lot of genre movies. Yes, and, and poor, poor Carrie. I mean, her religious fanatic mother... Um, pig's blood on prom night when she was just trying to have a romantic evening, tormented by her classmates, especially tampons being thrown at her in the school gym locker room. I mean, come on here. And the raven was called sin. Poverty and shame befall those who let go of discipline. But those who hold on to reproof receive honor. Walk with the wise and you become wise. But the companion of fools fares badly. Go to your closet and pray. Go to your closet. We'll burn everything together and pray for forgiveness. Go. But if I go to the prom, people will not laugh at me, right? I don't think so. They're all going to laugh at you. we got to get you in a movie somehow. Like, a, we'll, I'll write the script for you. You can be like the crazy wine ant. Not bad. <laughs> so, yeah, there's so many great things about this movie. Uh, we've trudged over a million times. But, of course, when you talk about Carrie, you can't help but talk about that grand finale, one of the all-time greatest jump scares in the history of motion picture. So the first time you saw this movie and you got to the ending, do you recall just how freaked out you were? Yes. And I remember, again, when I first saw Carrie, it was, I was not scared, but it was rather sad. Um, just a, a lot of mourning, like with, uh, by the way, this innocent girl was. And then um, by the ending, um, when Sue Snell, who was the only one who was, you know, understanding, the one who sympathized toward her, by the time she reached that grave and has this like haunting dream about uh, 
you know, Carrie's hand reaching up from the grave and attacking her, and then she wakes up. Yes, that was pretty scary. And some of my friends had mentioned that you won't really be creeped out until the ending. And I didn't believe them at first. I'm like, wait, this is a horror movie. It's got to be scary throughout the movie. And then they're like, no, just watch it. You won't be creeped out till the end. They were right. Yeah, but here we are, and I think so far the movie's been remade at least three times now. And it's probably going to be remade five or six more times where it's over with. It's just a timeless movie. As long as you have alienated teenagers, Carrie's always going to resonate. And I think for that reason alone, it's the top academic horror movie ever. Ever. All right. Well, that's pretty much everything we've got for uh, the September edition of Fresh Faces, Frightening Fun Facts with Kit Kat, Kristen, and Debbie James. Uh, I'm still looking You're for getting a, a kick out of that, aren't you? I'm, I'm still looking for a, a J-related candy bar name for myself, and that would just really make yes. the entire thing work. And it's quite a tongue twister, too. <laughs> yeah, it's like how many kids, you know, they abbreviate it online, so it'd be like... But, uh, again, this is, quote, a friendly warning from the fresh faces. Whether being chased by a possessed car, swimming with deceiving aliens, or vampires dismembered victims, or, worse yet, being terrorized by fictional gnomes, Better run fast or Harold the Scarecrow will overtake your body. Until next time, have a productive year, and if you escape, scream out a good cheer. That's all. I can't top that. It's a pleasure as always, people. Thank you for watching.